Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. With a continued passion for public television, we are proud to underwrite Informed Sources. Please join us in supporting WYES Television. Marcia Kavna, thanks so much for joining us. Sometimes major news stories spiral in different directions, as was the case this week with their recall effort against Mayor Latoya Cantrell. Among several developments, the city council called for an investigation of the mayor allegedly illegally using city funds to promote her accomplishments. And a judge overseeing the Cantrell case may have used poor judgment in personally signing the recall petition. We'll look at those stories as well as the latest in the upcoming governor's election, plus his history and hijinks in a culturally rich but troubled North Claiborne neighborhood. And on this weekend of the Academy Awards, our Future Watch segment examines the status of Hollywood South. Joining us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources. LeBron Joseph, news anchor and reporter, WGNO-TV Channel 26. Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter. And Dave Cohen, news director, WWL Radio. And we're going to stick with Dave. And the latest in the recall campaign against uh, Mayor Cantrell, um, we got some news this morning about some of the signatures. This was published in the paper. Um, they have gotten some of the signatures, but not all of them, but it's definitely showing some trends. Well, it's unclear what percentage of the signatures the recall organizers handed over on a thumb drive to the times and the New Orleans Advocate, uh, after an agreement and a settlement on how the, that information would be delivered. If it was all of the signatures handed over, then the recall organizers don't have nearly enough. But they have not said what percentage or if they handed over all of the signatures. But what we do know is the signatures they have that the paper has had an opportunity to look through and to evaluate show that overwhelmingly it was white, middle and upper middle class, affluent voters who signed the petition of those signatures that were provided to them. The recall organizers have been saying it's a cross-section of the community, that it's people from all corners and all walks of life. Based on this analysis, we don't know if that's true or not. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be surprising that overwhelmingly people who did not vote for or did not vote at all in Cantrell's re-election would be those people who would sign the, the petition to have her removed from office. Politics would say it's mostly going to be people who are not politically aligned with her. Mm -hmm. That having been said, there have been uh, pollsters who have done, particularly at UNO, some looking into her current popularity, her numbers, her approval ratings, and they have seen a degrading base of support across all levels, uh, particularly in the black community where there was more support before. But it appears based on this, that fewer black people signed the recall petition uh, than we may have been led to believe. Definitely in the piece that, the, that was in the paper today, um, they, they note that they don't have all of the signatures. The, the campaign organizers were supposed to turn over all of these signatures to them. Actually, on Ash Wednesday, they didn't get them all. Um, they got a thumb drive, but there are more supposedly out there with the registrar's, registrar's office, but we don't know how many. So. What do we really glean from this information that we're getting? Well, not a whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we know, uh, to me, it's, it's not unexpected. But mm -hmm. they had them, they had to anal analyze them, they had to publish what they found in their analysis. So what they're telling us is, of the signatures that they were provided, it's largely, overwhelmingly, mm -hmm. white, affluent voters who signed the recall petition. I have a crazy question. Could they be protecting certain voters who are worried about backlash if those sig their signatures were released to the media? Potentially, although we know that at least one of the signatures that was released was to... Was the judges. Was the judges <laughs> who was overseeing Which we're the going kid. to talk about. Yeah, we'll also. talk about that coming up. But um, So we don't know how or why 
the recall organizers have been very quiet yeah. on the whole process of how they release the signatures, which signatures they released, what percentage of the signatures they are. They haven't even said. The last time they actually said how many signatures they had, was two weeks before the deadline to gather signatures, and they said they were a thousand short of what was the deadline at that time, and they were still gathering them. So we don't know how many there are. The Registrar of Voters has been equally uncooperative yeah. in turning over mm -hmm. those records. You know, the whole situation with these petitions and these signatures have violated law <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> Initially, the law makes it very clear that once there's one signature on mm -hmm. the page, it's a public document, mm -hmm. and the recall organizers were the custodian of those public documents, mm -hmm. and they were by law required to share them at any time that any member of the public asked. They didn't do that. Mm -hmm. They hemmed and hawed, they went to court to try and stop it, they held up the process, then they tried to settle with the paper out of court, on making it happen. Then they came back and said, well, if you want copies, you got to pay for the copies. Right. And they were talking about $15,000 in copying fees. Then they gave them the thumb drive, but that appears to not be complete. So even that having been said, the law then makes it very clear, once the registrar receives those documents, they are now the custodian of the public documents. I think that some, there was a segment of the population and some of the folks that we've talked to from time to time have, uh, it's been defeatist on the part of the recall organizers to not be as transparent because I think that there have been people on the fence who say, you know, I want to support this and I don't know if I, I want to sign the thing. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, but it seems as if there's just a, too many moving parts here and I'm suspicious of even that side. And so that's been pretty interesting. To sort of there see was that no before. doubt that was part of their strategy. Yeah. Keeping information to themselves, not releasing those documents, which were public documents, mm -hmm. clearly they thought was in their best interest and gave mm -hmm. them the best yeah. opportunity to win enough signatures to force a recall. The Registrar of Voters does have one avenue by which they can say, hey, we're trying to get these things counted. We mm -hmm. are facing a deadline. If we let every member of the public, yeah. which includes the media, mm -hmm. come and look at them, we We're can't count them. Count. We can't right. review them. We can't verify them. So they have not said anything publicly and why they won't share the documents. Nor but have under they really law, revealed they have. their process of how they're, they're documenting all of these either. No. And the only thing they've said is they are on pace to complete it on time. Yeah, and okay. the, the Secretary of State has also said that that the office has been given help from some of the other registrars in the region. Right. Not sure exactly how many employees they've gotten from which offices around the region, but he has revealed that much as the least. Let's talk now about the judge. You refer to a judge, and that's Jennifer Medley, who is overseeing mm -hmm. a lawsuit filed by, um, I'm getting, that was filed by the campaign, right, to get... To, was that, to, to, by the recall, or, by the recall, 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 recall campaign, mm -hmm. yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, um, because they felt like there were the, the threshold by which they had to reach to force the recall was flawed because they started looking at documents and they said they started getting calls from people saying, hey, my mother is still listed as an active voter. She's been dead for seven years. Mm -hmm. I've moved out of town. I moved out of town three years ago and I'm still listed as an active voter in Orleans Parish, which raised red flags immediately about has the canvassing of Orleans Parish voters been accurate and complete? The law calls for an annual campus, uh, canvas, and there are databases that are supposed to be used. Uh, death notices or death records are, are one of those things. Change of address forms are another. Mm -hmm. That the recall hired a consultant who very quickly, they say, accessed this information and found 32,000 voters mm -hmm. that were either dead or no longer lived in Orleans Parish that were still listed as active voters. That's important because they are required to get 20% of the active Accurate. voters yep. on the rolls to sign the petition to force the recall. So the judge, who didn't make a ruling in the case because the Secretary of State's office and the recall organizers settled out of court, mm -hmm. she endorsed it, she signed off on it, and she did make some preliminary rulings that people are saying, hold on, did she make those rulings because she signed the petition. Mm -hmm. Which and she did. And those signatures that the paper got, her signature was there, and they revealed the fact that her signature was there. Yeah. So That's how we know. She's not said anything publicly. Um, she's not acknowledged or denied that. Now, legal analysts disagree on what her responsibility was. Mm -hmm. The law says that a judge 
and the judicial rules of conduct say that a judge cannot endorse or um, oppose any candidate for any public office, that they're supposed to be neutral. Well, is the signing of a recall petition an endorsement well, do or you an lose opposition your, of do a you, candidate? Do you lose your right to vote when you sit on the bench? No, you can vote. You cannot right. publicly, though, endorse, support, right. or oppose a candidate. I think her argument candidate. is this is calling for an election. It's not saying yay or nay to a candidate. It's, it's calling for a recall election. Anyway, to quickly move along, the the, uh, the brochure that uh, the mayor's office sent out touting her accomplishments, council wants to take a look at that more closely about where mm -hmm. the money came from. Yeah, on Wednesday, they officially voted to launch an investigation. It's about $51,000 in public funds that they believe were used to pay for this mailer that went out to uh, active voters in mm -hmm. Orleans I Parish. Uh, <laughs> with clearly the intent of promoting the mayor's accomplishments. It, on its face, that's what it was doing. And in the Nick, midst of this recall campaign, by the mm -hmm. way. In the final yeah. days yeah. of yeah. trying to get enough signatures, uh, yeah. the mayor clearly wanted to better her position and put some positive uh, vibes out there about what she has done amidst all the reporting on negativity and claims by the recall organizers. But the law makes it clear, you can't put out a promotional mm -hmm piece of material at taxpayer expense. You can put out a report card, you can put out an update, you can put out information on what the government's doing, but this on its face appeared to be purely promotional for the mayor. Her office initially denied that. They later said they were turning it over to the law office for a review to see if any laws were violated. If she pays it back, is that an admission of guilt? Mm. If okay. she doesn't, is it a violation? And even if it is a violation, it doesn't appear at this time there's any prosecutor who's going after her. Yeah, but counsel is right now, so they want to take a closer look at it. So we'll be seeing how that unfolds. And All right. This thanks. mailer actually went out as the mail-in, the mail-out ballot. Yeah, the yeah. signature They're mailers were sent out around the same time. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Okay, we're going to stick with you right now, LeBron. <laughs> okay. You talk about something else. Uh, there's a party happening every Sunday, it seems, yes. underneath the overpass of North Claiborne. Yeah, um, that stretch from about Esplanade Avenue all the way to, you know, where the Circle Food Store is on St. Bernard has become a very popular place. If, if you can wrap your heads around uh, this looking almost like the lakefront, but under the uh, <laughs> overpass mm -hmm. there, uh, you've got the confluence of a couple of different establishments. Um, Kermit's placed the, the bar, the mother-in-law bar, uh, the Treme Hideaway, another bar. You've got the seafood place uh, run by the Wynn family, Cajun seafood, which has become very, very popular, uh, Manchu chicken and all. Um, and the bridge, while it uh, certainly people say that it, you know destroyed that whole boulevard right. in terms of the construction of it, it has become a gathering place. In the summer months, that bridge is a natural uh, it's shelter. Shade. Yeah. Yeah. Shade Much shelter. cooler under the that bridge. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Under the bridge, uh, uh, um, if it's raining, you could still be under the bridge, if you will. But folks have started to gather there. You've got a number of the Social Aid and Pleasure Club second lines that pass along there. It's a very popular place. The problem is these very large crowds of people, you have uh, the kids on the four-wheelers and the motorbikes and the burnouts and the spinning around and some of that stuff which has been very, very dangerous. Uh, the city has identified that as being a, a dangerous place, a dangerous spot, if you will, and there have been crime incidents and violent crime incidents uh, along that stretch fairly recently where the city has taken the steps, or at least the NOPD, to enhance patrols there. Mm -hmm. And all but shut down for, for some of these folks. Hey, they're shutting us down. They won't let us you know, gather under the bridge. City contends, no, we're not trying to say you can't be under the bridge, but we've got all of these elements, and the best way to sort of control this is for us to enhance the patrols there. That being said, uh, it also helps the city with another issue beneath the bridge, and that is uh, the issue of illegal vendors. Mm -hmm. and, and while it, it, that's a segment unto itself, because the vendors contend that getting the city permits and all of that is, is a cumbersome process, uh, and it doesn't work for all of the vendors. However, there is no doubt you, you, you have to side uh, with, with the legal side on this when, in fact, someone's got in the back of their pickup truck an entire bar and they're selling alcohol. Right. <laughs> you can't There's, do there that. There is a process. There is a process. And, and that's requires, how the whole city functions. That is how the whole world functions. There's a process, and that's illegal. 
and there's a bar across the street that sells alcohol that that has that is licensed paid, that is licensed their taxes, yeah. pays their state taxes uh, their licensing and everything else the uh kermit's mother-in-law lounge two incidents have happened over there in the past um, I'd say um, Mardi Gras night, a woman gets killed over at that place. Tons of people out there. I, of course, you throw away, okay, that's Mardi Gras, you know. But just a couple of years ago, a woman comes out of Kermit's and is hit by one of these kids on a four-wheeler and she dies. And so you've had some things happen along there. And that's not, that, that's a small microcosm of the number of incidents that have happened over there. It puts people at risk. And, uh, it's a, it's a situation where the conversation is going to have to continue. I don't think that the city doesn't want people to sort of gather and have a good time on a Sunday. Right. And if this is a place where we can relax or dance, whatever the story is, a lot of music and culture and everything. However, they've got to figure out a way that this is done safely. Well, it's an odd dichotomy because you had for a whole generation, mm -hmm. the, the whole idea was, did the interstate ruin the community? Yes, right. That's correct. And, and yeah, people yeah, don't yeah. gather anymore, and people yeah, yeah. don't spend time together, and it's, yeah. it's, it's made this uh, community that is undesirable for people to live in. Yeah. But now you have people coming together Huge. and mm. celebrating things and enjoying their Huge. community. You have to follow the law while you do it. But make everybody happy. So finding that balance is, yeah. I guess, the challenge. But is this related to the scene that was so famous in Treme? Because it's kind of in the same area. Um, <laughs> the, that with kind the Mardi Gras kind of and all yeah, that. Yeah, kind of yeah, street activity and... Yes and no. I, I think, uh, yes, at a gut level of, of this being an indigenous culture here with the brass bands and the second lines and all of that stuff and sort of, you know, butting heads with the administration, if you will. But I do think that there is a public safety issue here that has to be addressed significantly. It has to, it takes a little bit stronger for us to be able to give it a little bit more attention because we need people to be safe more. Because is it growing? It has grown over the past couple of years to, oh my goodness, it, it, it's outstanding to see. It's, it's, it's amazing to see, but it's... It's a cultural it's, celebration. Yes, um, every weekend, yeah. but it could be a dangerous deal also. Yeah, and there do have to be some safeguards. But yes, they do. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you can't set up a bar in the back. And of the you truck. can't put the bar in the back of the pickup, or a restaurant in the back of the that pickup. That's correct. Or, yeah, that's crowd what, control. But that's what there needs to be a Saints game every Sunday. Because when there's no Saints game, people will, don't know what to do. <laughs> Figure out something yeah, to do. Just tailgating. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a big tailgate. All that's right. right. Thanks a lot, LeBron. Don, over to you. Hollywood South. Are we still? Uh, we, well, we still are, and L.A. and New York City and Atlanta are still bigger hubs than we, and we are all super-duper slow right now in terms of productions. Um, normally, here in New Orleans, or the state area, we would have 15 to 25 major TV shows and movies in production any month of the year, 12 months a year. Currently, there's one production mm. shooting in the area, just one, and there's a Netflix Netflix show that might be starting soon. The only reason we have those two is because they are already written, they were already underway, they're already done. The slowdown is industry-wide, it's national and international, and it's because of two reasons. The first of which is the pandemic. Let's talk about the pandemic for everything. But the pandemic effect on the Hollywood industry is during the shutdown, there was a lot of, lot of demand for content. So all the studios ramped up their, their production and their streaming and everything they could do because what, we were all sitting home watching their content. The, right. the demand for any kind of television content or movie content was very, very high. That demand has gone down a little, so that's simple economics. The demand's not there as much. But the bigger issue is that there's a looming writer's strike. The Writers Guild of America is in talks. Their contract expires on May 1st. Um, if they strike, the last time they did, it was 2007. They walked out for 100 days. No product, nothing happens when the writers are on strike because when you're in production, even if, you know, they don't say, all right, here's the script, I'm out, we're yeah. done. They sit around, there are rewrites, there are constant rewrites. The writers need to be part of it, part and parcel the whole way through. So if the writers aren't there, the, the productions aren't happening. Um, so there are efforts underway in industry-wide to try to stop the writer's strike. I'm told by, by Carol Morton with the city's Office of Film and Television that once it does all get worked out, which it ultimately will, we still sit in fourth place as the biggest, as one of the biggest hubs of television and film production. We've got the equipment, we've got the trucks, mm -hmm. we've got the, the crew, the talented crew, 
We've got everything we need here. A lot of support services. Tons of mm -hmm. support services. But right now, you can imagine the trickle-down effect that's happening. Yeah. I mean, in my personal life, I know landlords who have beautiful rentals that aren't being leased by actors and directors and, and studios. I know a set designer who had to leave his wife for six months and take a job in Atlanta where where they are still filming something um, because he had to get work. There are drivers and cooks mm -hmm. and makeup people and cleaning people and personal trainers and dialect coaches and, you know, it just mm -hmm. goes. So the, the fear of the looming strike is what's keeping productions from moving forward? Correct. Wow. Because no one wants to start. Even, yeah, no one wants to start, start and have to. It's too right. expensive for them to ramp up, start the production, and then have it shut midstream. Right. Mm -hmm. So they just don't. Um, so to put some things in number perspective, in 2021, uh, there were there was a billion dollars worth of film and television in New Orleans. In 2022, it was 900 million, so mm -hmm. yeah, just shy. Um, where we are so far this year, there aren't budgets out, but you know we're we're not even a quarter of the way through the year, and we only have one production shooting, so it's uh, not looking good. Hopefully the Hopefully they resolve a strike very quickly. Hopefully. Hopefully they don't strike and they get it resolved very quickly and production can ramp right back up. But if you're enjoying driving down the roads and not being detoured because of their <laughs> catering truck and the lighting people and the, the reason is they're just not here. Yeah, you're yeah. seeing fewer of those big yellow signs. Right, right, right. Telling right. You know, With where the productions are and where the staff should park. And the, yeah. Anybody from New Orleans in contention for the Academy Award? Uh, so, uh, there so. is nobody from New Orleans in contention for the Academy Award. Right. No one from Louisiana either. And no, mm. nothing that was shot here, no mm -hmm. costume people. Unfortunately, it's a rough year for New Orleans and mm -hmm. Hollywood South, but um, they do expect it to bounce right back when it does. Um, and partially because if we're going to see new shows, they always debut in the fall. Um, they need to get started real soon to be able to yeah, have those new shows do. in the fall. So that the onus is on everyone to get it worked out quickly. Mm -hmm. But because a lot of people do depend on that now in this area, it, it and, is and a that, major you know, industry. industry. Yes. You know, we've grown those support. A billion services. dollars in a year. It's a, it, that's yeah. big business. Well, a lot Definitely. of people have left our industry. Yeah. To, go to go into to that, that industry. industry. Yes. Yes. We, we all know that personally. Yeah. I mean, we hope that it all comes ramps up again. Well, soon. May first is the deadline for that contract, yeah. so it'll sometime between now and May first, okay. we should hear mm -hmm. more. All right, then. Thanks a lot. Okay, E. Another thing coming up this year: governor's race in Louisiana. How's the field looking? Well, it was the week of coming and going. Okay, um, going was Garrett Graves, who's the, yeah. who's the congressman from the, the Baton Rouge area. Very highly respected young guy. Uh, made his reputation on environmental. Uh, legislation was, ele was elected to Congress, and people saw him as a, as a potential candidate. And they always say, especially the Republicans, I got together with my wife and we prayed, and then uh, we decided not to. Um, so uh, he announced he wouldn't. And of course, he's got, you know, his party's in the majority. His colleague yes. down the road is Steve Scalise, who's the majority mm -hmm. leader. Uh, if a Republican gets elected president, he's going to be in a, in a potential for uh, to be in a real powerful mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. And the, the advantage of being Congress is that there's no term limitations. And so if you went to, you can be there for as long as possible. The disadvantage is got to go to Washington back and forth. Um, but anyway, he decided that he was going to he was going to stay in there. And this couples with Billy Nungesser, who a few weeks ago, uh, who a uh, lieutenant governor, who decided that he'd stay as lieutenant governor. So we had two now who are out. Announcing in is a guy a lot of people aren't familiar with, Steve Wagesback, who's the CEO of, of, of Lot B, Louisiana Industrial mm -hmm. Business Association, very, very highly, highly respected. Uh, he, he'd worked for uh, Bobby Jindal, like he was an executive assistant. And he announced the day before yesterday that he was uh, resigning from La Vie, which was a hint right there. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, by all indications, he's running, so he's going to be in. Um, so the field is, is developing. Uh, a guy I've really interested is a guy named Sean Wilson, mm -hmm. who's been the, the, the head of the... Uh, transportation under John Bell Williams, everything you hear about him is really good. I mean, he's really, really bright, a good planner, uh, um, you know, just a real star. He's the lone Democrat in the thing, okay? So far. What? So far. Yeah. Edwards Democrat. has already well, endorsed no, him now. You're not going to get yeah. another major Democrat, yeah. okay, because it's yeah, all maybe public, some, Yeah, okay. maybe some without name recognition. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah. He's, yeah. He's carrying the torch for the Democrat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's relevant to the story. He's the lone black in the, in the campaign. But that's going to be, that's again, could get him into a runoff, okay? Um, they have, uh, have a hard time to run off. But anyway, the good reputation. And John Bell Edwards, who was, was once a lone Democrat and who got elected, mm -hmm. is endorsing him and is hosting um, 
um, a fundraiser for him. And so those are kind of like the new faces in the campaign. So it's coming together. Do we know, if, I mean, Edwards, what he had going for him in a red state as a Democrat was that he was pro-life, mm -hmm. uh, that he had a strong stance there. Um, and that allowed Republicans who might otherwise not to support him. Is there anything about Wilson? Do we know much about his politics that if we know it, is there a path for him to win some conservative support? Well, the thing that really held John Bell Edwards was that his opponent in the runoff was David Vitter. Yes. And David Vitter just couldn't get past the D.C. Madam sort of, sort of situation. And mm -hmm. so Edwards got into a runoff against the one high profile Republican that he could beat, and he did beat him. And then he got into a runoff against the second time against Eddie Responti, who didn't do a good campaign. And so John Bell was, was very lucky in those campaigns. But what happened to him, it's not likely to happen um, very often. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be Republicans. One thing that's curious is that um, both Wagaspak and, and, and Wilson, neither of them are elected officials. And mm -hmm. it was unusual for candidate for governor. And I was looking up today, just kind of quickly, and I may have missed something. When was the last time we elected a governor who wasn't an elected official at the time? Mm -hmm. and that was Sam Jones in 1940. Wow. Uh, who was a lawyer, who was an <laughs> assistant DA in Calcasieu Parish, wow. but who was anti-long at the time when it helped to be uh, anti-long. So that's the, you know, that's the last time. Okay, so you had talked about the, those who sort of entered the field this week, but of course we still have Jeff Landry in there. Yeah, well, Sharon well, Hewitt. Well, Jeff Landry, uh, Jeff Landry is still the leader. I mean, people yeah. talk about in terms fundraising of the money. Fundraising leader, for sure. Yeah, he's gotten yeah. more money than anyone. God, yes. But there is yeah. a segment of the Republican Party who yeah. thinks he's too far to the right. Yeah. And that's and why Waggis Graves... Waggis is going to fill yeah. that right. And that's why yeah. everyone was calling Graves and asking him. It's interesting to me that Graves announced he's not running the day before Waggis Back announced he is running. Do they work We're going to see if Graves is going to end up endorsing Waggis Back. Yeah, well, I think they I think they might have talked on the phone the night before. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he did say in his announcement that the field was going to be brightening up. Yeah. So. Okay, we're out of time for this segment. And now, other stories real quick. You, E. Well, last week we broke the story that uh, the azaleas were blooming. Now I have a, another story that the, the eagles are flying, okay? Mm -hmm. and that sources at the Expressway Commission tell me that there have been bald eagle sightings along the shores on both the North Shore and the South Shore. That's wonderful. <laughs> Great. Great to see. Uh, Bob Tucker laid to rest this weekend, uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, in fact, out at Greater St. Stephen in New Orleans East. Uh, and certainly there have been a number of tributes in various sources of the media, but he certainly made an impact here. He certainly did. Mm -hmm. We miss him. Yeah. Don. Seems like Mardi Gras was just last week, even though it wasn't. Get ready for more parades tomorrow and Sunday with no flying potatoes, lemons, or limes this That's year. That's right. Do not toss those potatoes. Not in Metairie, anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you'll still catch them in the Irish I think Channel. you might. Uh, March 22nd. That's the deadline for the Registrar of Voters to certify whether or not mm -hmm. there are enough uh, signatures on those recall petitions. Her office says they are on pace to make their deadline by March 22nd. That's only, though less than two weeks away. I know. We're waiting for that date. Okay, guys, thanks so much for being here. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. With a continued passion for public television, we are proud to underwrite Informed Sources. Please join us in supporting WYES Television.